The attack on Pearl Harbor pulled us into the war. In just a couple of hours, hundreds of Jap pilots hit our fleet hard, decimating our battleships. Thankfully, our carriers were at sea during the attack. This was quite a piece of good luck. But their attack on Pearl was just the beginning. The Japs hit all over the Pacific, from Malaya to the Dutch East Indies. They did a lot of damage, but they also stirred up a hornet's nest. We were mad, and our rage was directed one way, west to Japan. When we entered the war, we thought we'd get it over quick. We'd be home by Christmas telling stories about how we kicked the Japs' ass. Man, we were so wrong. Hitting Pearl Harbor wasn't enough for them. They wanted Wake Island, too. Now, Wake's just an airfield on a speck of sand in the middle of the Pacific, but they wanted it bad. After two weeks of clockwork bombing raids and landings, the Japs took wake. Our servicemen fought long and hard. Even the civvies pitched in. I guess they were all hoping that the Enterprise would show up to help. In the end, though, the Japs prevailed, and the commander of wake surrendered on the 23rd of December. Those Marines on Wake Island were outnumbered, but never outfought. Our attacks on the Marshall Islands only damaged the Japanese base at Taroa. Elsewhere, the fighting continued. The Japs dug themselves in and even had a few significant victories. They sank their first carrier, the Langley, and our biggest warship in the Far East, the cruiser Houston. So far, we hadn't managed to hit them back. We started to figure we'd be in the Pacific a lot longer than we originally thought. In April of 42, things were looking pretty bad. Morale was low, both in the Pacific and back home. One of our commanders came up with a daring plan to strike a blow at the Japanese. Not on some island somewhere, but right on their mainland. It was called the Doolittle Raid. Our grease monkeys modified a bunch of B-25s to take off from carriers, something they were never meant to do. They launched from the Hornet and bomb factories on the Japanese mainland. Didn't do a hell of a lot of damage, but it did show the Japs that we had a few tricks of our own. They were filling our breath on the back of their necks now. Some of the boys who flew the B-25s had to ditch in the ocean, but a few managed to crash land in China. Of the 80 crew, 71 made it back. We heard later that the Japs killed 250,000 Chinese just for helping our boys. The Battle of the Coral Sea was the first ever battle between ships that never even saw each other just hundreds of planes attacking each other and the carriers over the open ocean. The Japs did more damage to us than we did to them at Coral. They sank the Lexington and one of our destroyers, but we did manage to sink one of their carriers and damage another, the Shikaku. Even though we lost the battle, strategically, we kind of won. First, we stopped the Japs' advance. Second, and more importantly, we took out two of their carriers for later battles. Back in the U.S., our intelligence operation, codenamed MAGIC, was decoding Japanese communications. MAGIC discovered Japanese plans for another surprise attack, this time against Midway. The Japs made it look like they were attacking the Aleutian Islands up near Alaska, so that we would send part of our fleet away from Midway. But we knew what they were up to, and we weren't about to get caught off guard again. It was make or break time for us in the Pacific. The Battle of Midway was where everything changed. We broke their codes and their plans were clear. Most of our fleet was waiting for the Japs to show up, ready to get revenge for what they did to us at Pearl Harbor. We had three carriers there, the Enterprise, the Hornet, and the Yorktown. To back them up, we had eight cruisers and 17 destroyers. But the Jap fleet was awesome. They sent six carriers, seven battleships, 14 cruisers, and 42 destroyers. Against their fleet, Ours looked insignificant. The battle lasted three days, and when the smoke cleared, we saw the damage we'd done. We took out four of their carriers, the Akagi, the Kaga, the Hiryu, and the Soryu, and the heavy cruiser Mikuma. All up, we only lost one carrier, the Yorktown, and a single destroyer. But it wasn't just ships that the Japs lost at Midway. We also splashed twice as many of their planes as they got of ours. A lot of good Japanese pilots were shot down at Midway, and I don't think their Air Corps ever recovered. In just three days, we'd broken the back of their fleet. Their carrier strike force, 
the Kiru Batai was all but wiped out. Even with their fleet wrecked, the Japs still had control of most of the Pacific, and thousands of miles south of Midway, the Japanese took control of Guadalcanal. We landed on Guadalcanal in August and took control of the Jap airfield. We called ourselves the Cactus Air Force. The Japs were well dug in and kept fighting for another six months. Our boys fought some of their hardest battles there in the jungle, including the Battle of Bloody Ridge. Off the coast of Guadalcanal, we managed to cut off their supply lines and stop them from sending more reinforcements. It wasn't until December that their emperor finally gave permission for their troops to withdraw. Clearing the threat in the Pacific was turning out to be a long and tough campaign. But at Guadalcanal, we stuck our foot in the door, and it wasn't going anywhere. In April of 43, our codebreakers located Admiral Yamamoto, the guy who planned the Pearl Harbor attacks. He was going to be flying in a bomber near Bougainville. 18 lightnings from Henderson Field flew hundreds of miles and shot down his Betty bomber. Before the war, Yamamoto had tried to talk his commanders out of attacking the U.S. They didn't listen, and even though he knew it was a bad idea, he planned the Pearl Harbor attack for them. At the start of the war, he predicted that for the first six to 12 months, he'd win victory upon victory. But after that, he said he had no expectation of success. He was a smart man, and they never did find his body. The Japanese commander at Betio Island had promised it would take a million men 100 years to take Tarawa. Rear Admiral Shibasaki, the commander there, had spent years fortifying the island. He'd put in new layered defenses that gave mutual support. When we did land there, after just a few hours of bombing, our Marines were cut to pieces by the Japs. The first wave suffered almost total casualties. Eventually, we took the island, but not before we lost 1,500 men. The Japs lost over three times that many. Tara was a learning experience for us, a lesson in how not to take an island from the Japanese. The rest of 43 was quiet. We all pulled our fleets back for repairs and refitting. Back home, though, things weren't quiet. Our factories were running at full speed. Back then, we churned out 7,000 planes a month, compared to just 1,500 that the Japanese could produce. It wasn't just planes, though. Our shipyards were also running full tilt. Since the start of the war, we'd produced 500 destroyers and escorts. With a shortage of raw materials, the Japs could barely manage 30. The Marianas turkey shoot was the end of the Japanese Navy as a real threat to us. Their mistakes were coming back to haunt them. The Zero was a great plane, but they decided that maneuverability was more important than pilot safety. Sure, this gave Jap pilots an advantage in one-on-one -on -one fights, but in battle situations, our planes were superior. Eventually, the Japs ran out of good pilots. In Marianas, their planes were flown by pilots barely out of flight school. During the turkey shoot, they lost 220 planes compared to just 20 for us. Their second mistake was at Pearl Harbor. Originally, there were meant to be three waves of attacks. With the success of the first two waves against our fleet, the third wave was called off. The third wave's target was the tanks that stored our entire fuel supply in the Pacific. Things could have turned out very different if we'd had fuel problems at the start of the war. The Japs still had one weapon we couldn't match. For hundreds of years, Japanese society has been influenced by Bushido, the code of the samurai. To them, Bushido is a way of dying. For a Jap soldier, there was no greater honor than to give his life bravely in battle. Their final weapon was the divine wind, the kamikaze. If the turkey shoot was a disaster for Jap pilots, then the Battle of Lady Gulf was a disaster for their whole navy. When we landed on Lady Island in the Philippines, the remains of the Japanese fleet sailed to meet us for the final great naval battle of the war. The Japanese Navy was outclassed and the battle was a decisive victory for the US. Even so, the kamikaze attacks did a huge amount of damage, not all of it physical. The kamikaze sank over 15 US ships in the Philippines. Over the entire war, the kamikaze sank 40 ships. When the Battle of Lady Gulf was over, we'd sunk the biggest ship I'd ever seen their super battleship Musashi. We also sunk the carrier Zukaku, the final survivor of the Pearl Harbor attack. In all, the Japs lost 10 times as many ships and planes as us. 
With their defeat at the Battle of Lady Gulf, the Japanese Navy was finished. The invasion of Iwo Jima was the final stepping stone to Japan. Once we controlled the airfield on the island, we could easily stage bombing raids against mainland Japan itself. In the first raid alone, almost 280 super fortresses bombed Tokyo and raced 10 square miles of the city. Back in the US, our scientists were working on a top secret project to develop a fearsome new weapon the atomic bomb. But the Japanese weren't about to give up. When their prime minister announced that they would fight to the end rather than surrender, our leaders authorized the dropping of the A-bomb. They hoped that in the long run, this would kill fewer people than a full-scale land invasion. Just 10 days after the Trinity test, the parts were shipped to Tinian Island. On the 6th of August, the Enola Gay lifted off from Tinian and headed for Japan. Just three and a half hours later, they reached the city of Hiroshima, the bomb, Little Boy detonated 2,000 feet off the ground. The blast leveled 90% of the city. Three days later, the boxcar headed for the island of Kyushu. The weather got bad, so the pilot switched to his secondary target, a torpedo factory at Nagasaki. His bomb, Fat Man, exploded over Nagasaki. The hills limited the damage to just 30% of the city. All up, the bombs killed about 100,000 people and injured more. Five days after Nagasaki, the Japanese Emperor Hirohito announced his country's surrender. The war was over. We'd beaten the Japs, peace was restored in the Pacific, and our boys headed home. Pearl Harbor was hell. One minute I was thinking about getting out of bed, the next minute the sky's so thick with planes I could barely see the sun. After Pearl, the Japs headed for our base at Wake Island. If we lost Wake, then the rest of our bases would be within their reach. They weren't gonna get it without one hell of a fight. The Jap base at Tarot was fat with supplies and equipment. And we were gonna blow that place to kingdom come. We wanted to show them they weren't the only game in town. The Jap Navy was headed for Australia. But we cut them off in the Coral Sea. Thanks to the code breakers of magic, we knew where and when the Japs were gonna attack next. We weren't gonna be surprised again like at Pearl Harbor. This was our chance to return the favor they did for us at Pearl. We were headed for a place called Guadalcanal. It's a big jungle island and the Japs were well dug in. So we got ourselves ready for months of mud and sweat and mosquitoes and death. The Japs had been in control of Terra Toll long enough to concrete the whole darn place. The Marines landed there on the beaches, so it was up to us flyboys to soften the place up. Two of the Jap carriers that hit us at Pearl Harbor were stationed at Marianas. We were heading into one hell of an air battle. The Japs gathered all their capital ships in the Philippines to stop us taking it back. One of their ships, the Musashi, was about the biggest battleship ever built.
Iwo Jima is just a lump of volcanic rock out in the middle of nowhere, but it was one step closer to Japan, and it had a couple of nice fat runways for our B-29s. My name's William Crow. I'm a pilot in the U.S. Navy. My dad used to be a pilot in the United States Air Force, so growing up we moved around a lot. New towns, new schools, new friends. Dad used to take my kid brother Charlie and me to the air base at whatever town we lived in at the time. Every year there'd be new planes, new models. Every year they were faster and stronger, each one better than the one before. Then there was the accident. Some pilot screwed his landing and crashed. Dad was working in the hangar. He ran out and pulled the pilot from the burning plane right before it went up. Dad was badly burned. He was lucky to be alive, but he couldn't fly anymore. He got a discharge and a pension. Well, the pension was never enough, and pretty soon we found ourselves farming a patch of dirt just to get by. Out there, the only things we had plenty of were dirt and sky. Our only entertainment was a busted old crop duster, so Charlie and I became the Dirt Duster Brothers. We flew the wings off that old crate. As much fun as that was, it couldn't last forever. The Navy was our way out. When we got old enough, we joined up. I graduated from flight training at Pensacola. Charlie trained as a sailor. Before long, we got our postings. I was stationed at Hickam Field, Pearl Harbor. Charlie was on the USS Arizona, a great name for a great battleship, the pride of the fleet. Dear Mom and Dad, there's no easy way to tell you this. Charlie's dead. I wanted you to hear it from me before the man from the Navy arrives, but I'm not sure this letter will beat their telegraph. Charlie was on the USS Arizona, which was moored on Battleship Row. The Japs knew what they were after. They hit the ships while our boys were still on their bunks. The Arizona went down during the attack. As she sank, we could hear the boys trapped inside, screaming for our help, but we couldn't get them out. I'm sorry I can't write more, but as of this morning, we're at war. I'm shipping out for Wake Island in a couple of hours. I swear this to you now, those Japs are gonna pay for what they did to our family and our country. William Crow. Somehow I managed to get the Admiral back to the Enterprise in one piece. His cat was so full of holes it just about sank right after they landed. Later we got to talking. He was mighty grateful. He even said I'd done a fine job, which was a big compliment from an old hard ass. He told me he was transferring to another carrier, the Lexington, and he wanted me to come with him. We were lucky to have any carriers at all. If they were at Pearl like they were supposed to be, we'd be out of the war already. Before I knew it, I was on board the Lady Lex with a whole new crew. We were on our way to the Marshall Islands. My new squadron leader was a guy named Callahan. The Admiral had put in a good word for me, and I was even assigned my own wing. The ace I fought over the Marshall Islands was Kazuma Yamashita. He was part of the infamous 13th Airborne Squadron who had led the attack on Pearl Harbor. These guys put the final bombs into the Arizona. These were the guys who killed Charlie. The 13th Airborne had the Jap Navy's best flyers, and they put them in their best planes. Callahan said I was lucky to be alive. He'd fought him before, and I was lucky it wasn't Shunagawa, their leader. He was the best flyer Callahan had ever seen, and he was racking up kills all over the Pacific. But I'd survived the fight and brought the Zero down in one piece. It was weird to fly, light as a feather and armed to the teeth. The plane was crated up and shipped back to the Naval Intelligence boys in San Diego. The guys we rescued from the POW camp had only been in there about a month, but they were in bad shape. They'd been starved and beaten by the Japs. Well, I got talking to one of them, a guy named Tom Stewart. Turns out that he was a pilot who'd been shot down and he was itching to fly again. Callahan found a place for him in one of the other wings of our squad. So ex-prisoner of war Tom Stewart got another chance to fly for his country. Callahan ran a tight squad, and before we knew it, we were brushing up on our torpedo runs and dive bombing for the battles ahead. The rest of the squadron had already started celebrations when I landed. We'd finally managed to hit back at the Japs and the Shoho was well on its way to the bottom of the Pacific. Later, Callahan and I headed down to the hangar deck to check the damage to our planes. We heard a noise and someone ran off. We didn't catch him, but we found a chunk of metal wedged into the ammo tray of my Corsair. We'd surprised some bastard who tried to sabotage my plane. 
Callahan and I decided not to tell anyone. We didn't want the other pilots to panic. After that, I personally checked every inch of my plane before every mission. The Battle of Midway was a huge victory for us, but the Jap ambush took the edge off any satisfaction we might have felt. There was no way it was a coincidence that a whole Jap squadron found us all alone out there. Someone had to have told them where and when we were patrolling. Somehow, the Japs who'd found us were from the 13th Squadron. I'd splash Kato Fujiwara, another of their aces. Callahan and I went and talked to the Admiral. We told him about the ambush and the earlier sabotage to my Corsair as well. He listened closely. We were making some pretty serious claims. Sabotage was one thing. It could just be a little professional rivalry for top place on the kills board. But the ambush, well, that's an act of treason, punishable by death. The boys were jumpy. News of the ambush had spread, and now there were rumors of a rat in the ranks. Our time station at Guadalcanal should have been a welcome break from the monotony and the claustrophobia of carrier life. But the place was a mosquito-infested mud hole, and it was still crawling with jabs. Our days were 90% boredom and 10% nail-biting terror. The Japs raided us regularly, usually from the air, but sometimes from the jungle where they were holed up. Callahan Stewart and I started a chess club to pass the time. It was either that or go insane waiting for the sound of planes. Our POW buddy Stewart was easily the best chess player, and he turned out to be pretty deadly in the air as well. It wasn't long before he made his way close to the top of the kills board. One day, out of the blue, the base commander came to see me. He had two letters from my mom. He said there'd been a delay in the mail delivery. I opened the first letter. It was bad news. Dad had never been 100% since the accident, but he'd gotten worse. She wanted me home to spend some time with him. I knew immediately what that second letter would say. It was too late to go home. I don't know if he was trying to keep my mind off what was going on at home, but the commander told me that the 13th Squadron was operating around the Gilbert Islands. He said the task force was going to retake the island that the Japs had captured from us at the start of the war. Our old friend the Admiral had requested pilots and the commander was sending our squadron to help out. Tom Stewart was lucky. Too lucky. His engine trouble was too convenient. He was back on the carrier safe in his bunk while we were fighting for our lives against the 13th Squadron. The other pilots were furious. They wanted his blood. They found Stewart in his bunk. They pulled him out, screaming traitor, Jap lover, and worse. Callahan and I could barely stop them from stringing him up right there. We got him out of there and back to Callahan's room. Tom pleaded with us. He promised he wasn't a traitor, that he hadn't sold us out to the Japs. I wanted to believe him, but there was part of me that wasn't sure. But the other guys, they wouldn't fly with him anymore. And even if he did fly with us again, he'd be likely to get a tail full of U.S. issue bullets. Callahan grounded him and took his wings away. He said it was for Stewart's own safety, but I think it was for all our sakes. Earlier during the recon mission, I'd taken out an ace called Taiki Hasegawa from the 13th. I'd fought three of their top guys, but I still hadn't had a chance to fly against Shunagawa. If it weren't for Tom Stewart, I'd be dead. He protected me from the Japs and then drew them away. That gave me a chance to make it back to the carrier safely. His body was recovered later. By the looks of it, he'd gone down fighting and he'd taken out Ibuki Yoshihiro, another 13th Squadron ace. One thing was certain, we were wrong about Stewart. He was a patriot to the end and he died proving it. There was no way I could repay him for what he did, nor to apologize for doubting him. Callahan and I petitioned the Admiral for a proper tribute. We buried Tom Stewart as a hero, not as a traitor. We were on a roll. We had the Japs on the run and we weren't gonna stop till we bombed Tokyo to hell. While the rest of the guys were celebrating, I could only think of one thing, that Shun Agawa, the squadron leader of the 13th, would somehow escape. One night there was a knock on my door. It was the Admiral. He'd had a visit from one of the other pilots, Mike Canning. Mike had admitted to sabotaging my plane after we sank the Shoho. He said he wanted to knock me down a peg or two on the kills board and that he was sorry. He got off lightly, but he was gonna be peeling potatoes for the rest of the war. The Admiral also said he had something for me. It was a crumpled letter that he'd gotten unofficially. The letter was from the 13th Squadron and it was addressed to me. It seemed that while I was after them, they were after me. I opened the letter. There were just two words on it, Iwo Jima. It was from Shunagawa, the leader of the 13th Squadron. I would get my wish, a chance to fly against Agawa and avenge my brother. 
I didn't care that Iwo Jima was won, or that the way lay opened in Japan. I only cared that I'd defeated Shunagawa in the 13th Squadron, and that I'd avenged Charlie's death. The Admiral presented us with the Distinguished Flying Cross for achievement for our country, and then he sent us home. For our squadron, the war was over. I didn't know what to feel, jubilation or relief. I survived, but I'd lost so much in just a few years. My brother and father were dead, as well as countless good men I flew with. I sent a lot of Japs to the bottom of the ocean. Some of them must have been good men too. Pretty soon we shipped out for home. It was the longest trip I'd ever taken, but I'll never forget seeing the U.S. soil again. Mom looked tired, but boy was I glad to see her. First thing we did was catch a train to Washington, D.C. to see where Charlie and Dad were buried. I still see Callahan and the rest of the boys every year. We have a drink and salute the thousands of men who are the real heroes of the Pacific. <laughs>